So our next presenter is Dr. Gail Renka. Thanks, Luke, and thank you, Dr. Renka, for really setting up my presentation really nicely. Uh, I guess, you know, I'll be hitting on a lot of the themes that have already been discussed. Uh, you know, fundamentally, we're trying to bring a technology to the market that will try and restore the health of the soil. Now, that's a very nice and warm and fuzzy uh, statement, but we're going to try and unpack what that means. Um, when you think of a healthy soil, as Dr. Honeycutt alluded to, typically the number one thing you're thinking about is a high organic matter content soil. A rich soil, a soil that is soft, porous, has high water retention capacity, and has a healthy thriving uh, biology in that soil. That's what you would call a healthy soil. So um, all of these things are fundamentally predicated on the foundation of good organic matter content, which serves as the foundation for this entire ecosystem to develop. So the technology that we are trying to bring is something that mimics portions of what organic matter does in the soil, rather than trying to take a long-term view, which obviously is, is the correct thing to do, to actually build organic matter back up in the soil. So uh, we are a new company in the ag space in the United States. Uh, we are a company that is headquartered out of India. And we are a specialty polymer company. So we come at this problem a little differently. We have four divisions within the company in textiles, pavements, uh, paints, and agriculture. Uh, in the US, we're headquartered in Morrisville, so not far from Research Triangle Park as well. And uh, we're very passionate about making sure that all our solutions are sustainable across all our divisions. So, you know, this was talked about in the previous presentation as well, that while agriculture based, uh, while agriculture based on the intensive use of inputs has increased global food production, it has also in the process depleted the natural resources of many systems, including organic matter content. And when we look at this a little more, uh, with a little more uh, detail, this spiral is really what has been going on. You know, you have excessive synthetic input, as Luke alluded to, it leads to downregulation of a lot of root exudate production, loss of organic matter. You get erosion because you don't have a lot of organic matter binding that soil anymore. You start to run into compaction issues, and ultimately this entire collapse leads to a loss of the soil biology in the system. And when you lose the biology in the system, you lose the ability to naturally extract nutrients that are present in the soil, you become dependent on synthetic chemical input. And this has really been the story that has been incrementally playing out over a long period of time. So when we talk about loss of soil biology, and if you had to sum up soil biology in, in one picture, I think this would be it that you, you have root exudate production in organic matter, it feeds the fungal and the bacterial community, and those then percolate back up to this entire, uh, you know, various, I guess, hierarchical level of or organisms that are present in soil in terms of size. And this entire ecosystem is fundamentally what is doing the nutrient cycling naturally, and it is fundamentally what is enabling symbiosis between the root zone and the biology in the soil. So from our perspective, any technology that is focused on soil health fundamentally needs to be focused on bringing this back up, of making sure that we're reviving this cycle. And as you know, Wayne alluded to uh, earlier as well, it all starts and ends with the organic matter in the soil. So if you look at why is organic matter important, what is it fundamentally doing for you, and what can you do to try and mimic some of those functions? These are some of the things it's, I'm sorry, this is some of the things it's doing. It's building cation exchange capacity for you. It's serving as uh, food. It's serving as something that holds water retention, or, or serving as water retention capacity. Helps build that porosity and aggregation and structure in the soil. And it serves as something that can be used to mineralize uh, and serve as a nutrient source. Now, a lot of people are focused on uh, addressing various aspects of this in serving as food or serving as a nutrient source. There are some aspects of this that I think are 
not being addressed, and this is what our goal has been, in terms of how do you <coughs> synthetically build water retention capacity, soil structure, aeration and porosity into a soil? Can you do something via a technology that actually builds these attributes into the soil? As a, you know, think of it as a temporary stopgap measure till you uh, just activate the soil food web and you get on a, a sort of a glide path towards higher organic matter content over a couple of seasons. If you think of it from the perspective of a root, if you think like a root, what do you want out of a soil? You want it to be soft, you want it to be porous, you want it to have water retention capacity physical aspects of soil health. If you look at the biological activity, you want it to be thriving with biology, and that will promote uh, good nutrient cycling. So this is a biological component of soil health. And finally, you want to make sure that there are no toxic ions, no toxic metals, and you have the correct pH in the soil. When you have these three things, when you have the chemical, the physical, and the biological aspects of the soil address, you get a healthy and a thriving high-performance rhizosphere. I think someone alluded to a high-performance athlete earlier. In our view, when you fulfill all these conditions in the soil, you fundamentally give the plant the best possible opportunity to have a functioning rhizosphere. So, if you look at each of these individually, you know, pH of the soil, the cation exchange capacity of the soil, and the chemical aspects, there are some technologies that will address the pH, there are some technologies that will address the cation exchange capacity, uh, humans and, and things of that sort. If you look at the entire biological space, they will focus on you know, identifying the correct species, identifying the correct populations, uh, making sure that nutrient cycling is ultimately taking place. What we're trying to do is address all three of these together in one product. What we're trying to do is build a technology that addresses soil structure first, then provides a biological inoculation, and simultaneously provides cation exchange capacity. Now, that's, you know, it, it sounds like a lot of things, but it really it can be broken down very simplistically in terms of how this ultimately leads to agronomic benefit. And uh, the, the reason of wanting to address all aspects together is, and ev almost everybody has alluded to this, is that for any technology, whether it is a land management practice, whether it is a seed treatment, whether it is a you know, soil amendment like ours, if the performance is not consistent, you will not get the grower to adopt. Uh, this is a lesson I think everybody has, has learned and uh, you know, it, it, our experience has been the same. Now, if you look at the ultimate agronomic benefits, this is what you are really shooting for. Germination efficiency, irrigation efficiency, nutrient uptake efficiency, pest pressure, organic matter buildup, salt tolerance. The point of showing this this way is these are the three things that Zyphonic is doing for you. It is building porosity. It is building, uh, we do a mycorrhizae inoculation, but we are agnostic to uh, integrating further biological platforms onto this. And we do something for CEC, or cation exchange. These have the following cascade effects, and, and a lot of them. And those ultimately all are convoluted and you know, I'll, I'll use that term again, they're convoluted in terms of how they ultimately impact agronomic performance. So if you want to get these improvements, you cannot throw simply mycorrhiza or simply CEC or simply porosity. It will work, but it is not going to work consistently. And that lack of consistency is coming from the fact that there are a lot of interconnected nodes here that ultimately contribute to these agronomic uh, benefits and factors that you want to look at. Let's just look at one, and, and you know, as interesting book you mentioned exactly this. Nutrient uptake efficiency, uh, and we were talking about nitrogen. Nutrient uptake efficiency has to do with, it has to do with porosity, because better porosity is going to lead to better root development. It's going to lead to mycorrhiza inoculations, because you're gonna get a good uh, root extension. It's going to lead to, CEC is going to help with, maybe not nitrogen, but improve cation uptake. So all three factors contribute to nutrient uptake efficiency. It's not 
simply one factor. So this is just trying to demonstrate some of the porosity aspects of the product. What we're trying to show over here is that we are doing a, once the water percolates to the bottom, we are going to do a, a very good job of instantaneously building porosity. Now this is an exaggerated demo, this is not what happens in the field. This is just a, for video purposes to illustrate that we can build this fluffiness or porosity in the soil. Uh, speaking to what Wayne said, here is a research plot that we have. This is not treated. This is treated. And this is right after a rain event where you see that because of the porosity enhancement and the porosity inducement, you are getting infiltration of water. The moment you do this, you are starting to build a very, very conducive home for the biology in the soil. And that really goes to you know, a, a, a lot of uh, complexity that comes with the biological space. Uh, to me, it is it's still a bit of a black box as to what works, what doesn't work, when it works, why it works. So our view is rather than trying to inoculate, let's actually take into account that there are hundreds of thousands of more strains that are inherent and intrinsic and indigenous to that soil. So let's just build a better home. Let's just build a better home for them. Mycorrhiza, as we talked about, it helps with the root extension, so we do that uh, as well with the product. Uh, but we, you know, this is just a picture of, of some things uh, that we've done. This is just one demonstration. But more important than the picture is being able to consistently show that across different crops and soils, you can get the rhizosphere to perform to the best of its ability, or put the plant in the best possible position to perform. Potassium humate is something that we include for cation exchange capacity, and what that is really going to do is help you with your uptake efficiency and, and serve as fungal food uh, for the rhizosphere. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave this here with uh, this picture that the most important thing is to address all three together. If you don't address all three together, you are not going to remove or not going to address all the rate limiting factors that are involved in making sure that the rhizosphere thrives. You need to address the chemical, physical, and biological aspects together for consistent performance. And any technology focused on soil health needs to focus on reviving the soil food web and nutrient cycling in the soil. And uh, I think if you are able to do that, whether it is through practices like cover cropping, other soil health practices, something like our technology, ultimately you will automatically make farming more sustainable as a practice. So thank you, thank you for your time and thank you uh, for adding authority for uh, the opportunity. Yeah, Mikhail, thank you very much. And